The forbidden fruit of knowledge of good and evil is one of the most mysterious concepts in the Bible and really greater mythological lore. While there are many answers that can be said to apply to what the fruit of forbidden knowledge really was, there are some pretty obvious answers within the Bible if examined closely. So today we're going to break those down, as well as some of the other ideas that have become associated with it over time. The fruit of forbidden knowledge appears in the second story of the book of Genesis and the Garden of Eden narrative that comes right after the six days of creation story. In Genesis 2, after creating Adam and then the Garden of Eden, God places the tree of fruit of forbidden knowledge of good and evil there, as well as the tree of immortality. After placing Adam into the garden, God warns Adam not to eat the fruit of the tree of forbidden knowledge, stating that if he does so, he will die. Following this, God creates a wife for Adam, meaning that this woman, who will become known as Eve, was not there when God gave this command not to eat the fruit. This becomes important later, as when the serpent tricks Eve and Adam into eating the fruit, Eve claims that she was told not to even touch the fruit or else she will die. The serpent appears to use this mistake in Eve's own knowledge in order to trick her, as God did not claim that just touching the fruit would lead to her dying. The serpent thus is able to claim that God is lying to Adam and Eve because he knows that if they eat the fruit, it will make them like gods. This is something God does technically fear, as after eating the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, God claims that the humans have become like one of us, or one of the gods or angels, knowing good and evil. This does not mean the fruit would make them exactly like gods, as the gods are also immortal, and God specifically kicks Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden to ensure that they don't eat of the fruit of immortality as well. Now, a lot of mainstream Christian talk has the knowledge of good and evil as the knowledge of good behavior and sin, essentially and the eating of the fruit is often considered the first sin that allowed sin into the world as a whole. In Jewish tradition, however, this was not considered the first sin, though the act itself was indeed sinful. Instead, the knowledge of good and evil simply means understanding the actual spiritual implications of good and evil behavior. In Judaism and Christianity, we use terms like good and evil or sin to help describe our spiritual balance, but in the East, this was simply known as karma. Karma is simply the idea that every action has an equal reaction to it, and bad actions bring bad reactions, and good actions bring good reactions. In Hinduism, this affects not just this life, but also your next lives. These are concepts most people in the West already understand today, but what many do not realize is that this kind of logic is exactly what is used in the Bible. In both Exodus and Jeremiah, for instance, God is explained as repaying the sins of the Father onto the children of the third and fourth generations, and there are more instances of this elsewhere. In the book of Genesis, Cain's line is shown to have been wiped away by the Great Flood, seven generations after he murdered his brother Abel. The story of the Old Testament, in many ways, is a guide to navigating karma healthily through a specific covenant that the Israelites have made with God, as well as a history of how they have navigated the world based on the karma of others. After the fall of the Tower of Babel, for instance, God goes from interacting with the people as a whole to just interacting with Abraham, or as he was known before God changed his name, Abram. In Genesis 15, God helped guide Abram through the land that he says will one day belong to his descendants, the 12 tribes of Israel. But God cannot give Abram that land at this time, or even in this lifetime, and God gives a very specific reason for this. At the time of Abram's life, certain tribes such as the Amorites were living in the land, who were described as not having the iniquity of their sin reach full measure. This is a reference to those other passages of Exodus and Jeremiah, where a certain amount of sin has to exist before a civilization meets its destruction, such as Abraham sees with other cities such as Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of this, Abram and his descendants will go down into Egypt, where they will rise to power but then be held captive for a period, after which they will return to Canaan and be able to conquer the peoples that remain because of the iniquity of their sin. To the esotericists, Abram is just a corruption of Brahma, the god of the Hindu religion where these ideas of karma are said to originate. This is put forth as the reason Abram is said to be the husband and brother of Sarai, as Brahma, like many gods, had a cosmic counterpart who was both a sister and a wife, his wife being named Sarai Swati, or Lady Sarai, making her a perfect match for Abram Sarai in the Bible. It is having this kind of power that is considered to be too dangerous to be immortal, and thus the humans were kicked out of paradise. 
Even in Hinduism, there are stories about people or even entire clans of people that purposely subject themselves to certain torments in order to attain a spiritual blessing that is then ironically used to turn around and oppress other people. Karmic laws thus, even at the time of the ancient Hindus, were something that was understood as being exploitable. These karmic laws keep the lower animals in a certain balance, but when species like humans develop enough intelligence, it becomes possible for them to gamify their karma upward to use for growth and even to oppress others, as we said. When this happens, a higher divine being or god such as Krishna has to come down and manually topple those people abusing their power and knowledge of karma. Krishna is described as needing to come down rather cyclically in order to restore balance among the humans as well as save them from certain disasters. When it comes to the idea of karma in the Bible, the story only gets more interesting with the introduction of the New Testament. In the Gospels, Jesus Christ is presented as a divine figure who has come in order to help restore balance. He is the fulfillment of the original covenant, and with him he bring a new covenant to the greater world, one in which he died for our sins, making himself a sacrifice that essentially takes on our karmic debt. When it comes to talking to God, this is done through the name of God itself, which is closely related to the fruit of forbidden knowledge. According to the genealogy of Adam's third son, Seth, men begin to call upon the name of the Old Testament God, Yahweh, in the age of Enos, who is Seth's son or Adam's grandson. This is extremely early in the history of the world, and the wording implies not just that the line of Seth had this name, but that humanity as a whole was calling upon Yahweh. This was a name of great power, not one that just gave the gift of prophecy, but was said to also perform great works and miracles. Following the time of Christ, other apocryphal texts would emerge, such as the alphabet of Ben Sira, a retelling of the Genesis story that included characters such as Lilith, who is here claimed to be Adam's first wife, made from the same dust as him. When Lilith refuses to be subservient to Adam, however, she uses the ineffable name of God in order to fly out of the garden and escape Eden and Adam. At the same time, another text would emerge called the Toledot of Yeshu, or the Generations of Jesus, a Jewish text which claims that Jesus actually stole the ineffable name of God and used its power to perform miracles in order to mislead Israel and the world. While an understanding of karma itself helps you navigate your personal behavior, it doesn't help you navigate the greater world. And through the name of God, you get to know the future, which in terms of human behavior revolves largely around the karmic fates of the various tribes that exist. Throughout various Gnostic, Kabbalistic, and esoteric texts, however, there comes this pattern of humans being seen as rather predictable creatures. We have free will, and through that, anything is said to be possible, and we can change the course of history. But the nature of our material flesh, and our ability to only see so far ahead, makes us a species that is easy to manipulate as a whole, especially when you can see our futures. Thus, it is by giving this secret forbidden knowledge to humans that the serpent, or Luciferian figure, was said to set in place a series of events that would be virtually impossible for humans to avoid. Nowhere is this more clear than in the Greek tradition with the god Prometheus, found in the ancient texts like Theogony and Works and Days by the 8th century writer Hesiod. Prometheus means foresight, and he is named such because he himself was said to have the gift of prophecy. Prometheus was known for caring for humans more than the other gods and giving them gifts and blessings against the other gods' will. Such as humans getting the good meat of their own harvest, with Zeus and the other gods being tricked into only receiving the bones and skin, with Prometheus cleverly dressing up the bones with the skin in order to make them look like they had more meat. After being tricked by Prometheus like this, Zeus, like the Old Testament Yahweh, wanted to keep away a very specific forbidden knowledge from the humans, the knowledge of unwearying fire. Despite Zeus trying to prevent this from happening, Prometheus of course ends up doing just that, going against the wishes of Zeus, for which Prometheus and the humans are both punished. Prometheus is chained to the earth, similar to the fallen angels in the Book of Enoch. However, Prometheus was noted as doing this because he foresaw that one day Zeus would forgive him, because of how he had helped him fight in the Great Titan War against their own parents. And so, Prometheus is understood as a Luciferian figure in the Greek tradition, one who gave humans a gift that he knew would come with punishments for the both of them, but for which he foresaw they would one day escape. Because of this, Prometheus is not demonized in the Greek tradition the way the serpent is, but instead, he is revered, being seen as someone who foresaw a greater good for him in the 
the humans that would be worth both of their punishments for this forbidden knowledge. The fruit of forbidden knowledge is ultimately just a symbol, one that has many associations even within the Jewish tradition itself. But hopefully this video helped you get a better understanding of some of its ideas and the more esoteric aspects of the book of the Bible. For more information, subscribe as I have new videos in the works on similar subjects, and check out the playlist I put together containing all of my videos so far. It has over two hours of esoteric breakdowns. See you guys next time.